Good morning, Providence. Our scripture this morning is back in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is God's word for God's people. He may be seated. Uh, Before we pray and get into that, I just wanted to say quickly, uh, this last week there was uh, seven of us guys from Providence who went to a preaching workshop throughout the week, and uh, it was a great time, really helpful, and I was talking to a number of the like small group leaders at the workshop who help out, and all of them mentioned to me who had like some of our guys at Providence in their uh, small groups. All of them told me uh, just how they were so impressed uh, with some of our guys, how they were just sharp, they loved the word, they seemed to have a real calling on their life. And I was just really encouraged walking away because I've talked to a lot of pastors, I know a lot of churches, I know that's not the case everywhere, that God is just like bringing young men who want to preach the word, who want to lead God's people, uh, and who are trying to live in a godly way. And so I walked out just feeling really encouraged, and I just want you guys to know, uh, being here at Providence, there is something beautiful beautiful that God's doing uh, in raising up young men who just want to preach and lead and help people to know God uh, deeply. And so, uh, yeah, it was great. It also just made me personally very excited to preach. So uh, let me pray, and then we're going to get into this passage. Uh, Father, we are grateful. Um, The miracle of people coming to faith in you, being developed, to want to have a a passion for you, um, but also to teach other people, to lead other people, to step into the challenging work of ministry is no small thing. And so once again, I just say uh, thank you, God. Uh, We have so many people, both the men that we just uh, went with this week, but also so many people here who love you, who want to follow you, who want other people to know you, uh, would we never lose that? Would you continue to raise up disciples who are taking steps of faith, even like we just prayed into? Um, We need you, and we need you to help us to understand your word. It is the guiding document for our life. We get truth and wisdom from it, and so we ask that you'd give us sharp minds and soft hearts as we come to this text, that we might worship you in greater ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you desire most right now? Think about what comes to mind. What do you desire? Now, for some of you, um, you know, maybe you're here this morning and and simply you just desire kind of a relaxing Sunday because it's been stressful, you've been sick, you got some chaotic things coming up. Uh, maybe for some of you, uh, you're desiring that, you know, that girl sitting in the section next to you might say yes when you muster up the courage to ask her out sometime. All right? Maybe some of you, you skipped breakfast this morning and you got lunch plans and you're desiring a quick and to the point sermon. I can't promise any of those three things, all right? Um, but I also know, I mean, we have those desires and that's good and that's right. That might be the biggest thing on your heart right now. And... Some of you, immediately when I ask you, what are you desiring, that thing that's just been kind of burning in your soul just comes to mind. You know, the, the, just the deep desire you've had for that chronic illness finally to be relieved or healed. The desire that you've had to do something with your life, to make sense of it, to move forward. The desire that your marriage would finally take a U-turn and go back to a healthy relationship. Maybe some of you are sitting in the room today because you feel like you are at the end of yourself and your biggest desire is just to have some sort of encounter with God that might just be your last effort before you give up. You know, we have desires all the time, right? The big desires of our heart, the little desires of the things we want moment by moment, things that we, you know, want to have, things that we want to avoid, things that we want to happen in our life. But I want you to consider, in the midst of all of these different desires we have in life, all the things that we do desire, all the things that we should desire, I want you to consider, have you ever asked yourself the question, in the midst of all these desires, why do we go through seasons where you honestly would say, 
I don't really desire God right now. Have you ever asked yourself, like, why is it? I'm a Christian. I, I try to follow God. Why don't I desire Him right now? You know, I've asked that a number of times in my life. If you're a Christian, if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, I can guarantee you, you've had moments or seasons where you've just sat there and you said, man, that, that passion for Jesus just isn't really as burning hot as it used to be. You know, the, like, the, the sin just feels so much more appealing in this season than holiness. This desire to actually follow him and know him, the things that I know in my head just for some reason right now are not connected to my soul and to my heart. And the question is, in those moments, what do we do? Right? Like, how do we build, in those inevitable times where the, the passion is waning, is there any hope that we can desire God once again, that we can experience God again? Today, I want to offer you a practice that I think can help you desire God. Uh, what we've been communicating over the last month in this series uh, is that our practices, the, the like rhythms, the disciplines, the habits, all of that, those things actually do shape and form us. They shape who we are, how we think, what we, even what we desire. And if that is true, then we need a practice from Jesus that will help us in these moments throughout life actually desire him more than anything else. Uh, and I want to offer to you that one of the practices that can help you do that is the practice of fasting. And Jesus is going to invite us into this in Matthew 6. So if you have a Bible, flip there. Um, and I'll be honest, it may not be the practice that you want, <laughs> but it is a practice that I think you need. Um, as you're turning to Matthew 6, and we consider this, uh, let me just say, just to kind of define this for us, so we're all on the same page. Uh, when I'm talking about fasting today, here's what I mean. That fasting is abstaining from something. Now, most often it's food, but it could be other things. But, but it's abstaining from something for a period of time for a divine purpose. Okay, so it's abstaining. It's withholding something for a period of time, for a divine purpose. And I add that last part because um, there are just, you know, maybe you've done like just physical like fasts just for, because you want to be more healthy or you do intermittent fasting or whatever. That's great. I don't think that's wrong. But that's not what I'm talking about today. When we think biblically about fasting, it's abstaining for something for a period of time for a divine purpose, for a reason about God. So as we get to Matthew 6, let's notice three things that Jesus is going to teach us about the practice of fasting. He's going to talk to us about when you fast, how you fast, and why you fast. So let's look first at Jesus teaching us about when you fast. Uh, look at just the first few words in verse 16. And when you fast. You guys like my creative title for this point? I did drop the and, so I kind of summarized it a little bit. Uh, but a whole point on four words here, okay? Jesus says, when you fast. Simply put, I think the, the thing I want us to notice here is that the way Jesus begins his teaching on fasting is assuming that you will be fasting. Okay, did you notice that? Like, Jesus doesn't say, now... If you decide to fast and then give us instructions, he simply says, says, look, to his disciples, when you fast. It's the difference between uh, giving my sons instructions tonight. It's the difference between saying, if you decide to go to bed tonight, and when you go to bed tonight, right? Because as much as they wouldn't like it, right, there's the assumption you're going to bed at bedtime. I'm not saying if you decide to go to bed, here's what you should do. The assumption is you are going to bed. So when you do, brush your teeth and put your pajamas on. All right? The assumption is laid that that's happening. And it seems like Jesus is giving instructions, not if we decide to fast, but for his disciples, what to do when we fast. Uh, now, because we live in a context, like, and I'm not talking about culture, I'm just saying like in the church, like as Christians, um, fasting is not generally one of the top spiritual disciplines that we partake in, I want us to get on the same page and believe 
that fasting truly is a great practice that I think would be very fruitful in your Christian life. And I think Jesus is assuming that we'll take him up on that. Uh, Now, just quickly, you could argue, okay, you're making a lot out of one word, right? Not if, but when, and I'm arguing that. But here's what I would say. I think that the overall biblical teaching on fasting is actually that while the scriptures rarely command fasting, I think the scriptures do actually often assume fasting. I think what Jesus is saying here is actually what just the whole scriptures really give us. You could look at the Old Testament, and there was fasting at times where God actually told his people to fast, where they needed to do that. But oftentimes we get stories like in the life of David or the life of Daniel where there's no command to do it. It's just them responding to life with God and fasting is a part of it. And you'll read through the stories and it's not this big deal. It's just this thing. You know, they were fasting. It was just this assumed part of their life. Or even just in the book of Matthew, just two chapters earlier, Jesus himself went out to the wilderness and he fasted. And there was not this huge explanation on what it was. There wasn't this, you know, crazy surprise. It was just he had his time of fasting. Here, it's not if you fast, but it seems assumed when you fast. In Matthew chapter 9, the Pharisees are asking Jesus uh, why his disciples aren't fasting. There's this assumption that they will be. And Jesus says, look, while I'm here, they don't need to fast. But he says, when I leave, then my disciples will fast. Again, he doesn't give that as a command to the disciples. He just assumes, yeah, when I leave, then of course, they will fast. Acts 13, we just preached on a couple weeks ago, said they were seeking God, they were together, and they were fasting. No command, no big explanation, just that's what the church did. So I do think that biblically, fasting is just assumed that this is a part of life with God. However, for most today, it is not. So I would just have you ask here, consider, why not? Like, why not? If fasting is not a part of your Christian life, why not? And I I don't want you to consider that in a condemning way, okay? So don't sit like, oh, of course, I don't fast. I'm a horrible, no, none of that, okay? I don't think it's a law. I don't think it's a sin to not fast, but I do want you just to reflectively consider why is it, you know, because all of you, I'm sure you've opened up your Bible and you've tried to read before. I'm assuming most of you have prayed before. You've probably given some money before. You're sitting in this room gathering with the saints. So you're doing spiritual disciplines, but if you're not fasting, I just want you to begin to think, Why is it that I don't fast? And I just want you to keep that in mind and consider that as we move forward. Because I believe that Jesus assumes part of a healthy life following him will include fasting. Now, what does that fasting look like? Now let's read through the passage. And I want us to think about how you fast. Look again at 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So I've mentioned before in this series, what we're trying to do is kind of two things. I want to kind of help compel you to see the vision and purpose behind some of these disciplines, and I also want to practically help you begin to live them out, okay? Because we need a vision for it, but we also need help. So I'm gonna spend pretty much the rest of my sermon, the bulk of it, is just gonna be in this point, and I want us just to consider how we would fast. Uh, And if you noticed in this passage, Jesus actually gives like a contrast in two different ways. Did you see that? Like one way of how not to fast And then he tells his disciples, but when you fast, here's how you should do it. So let's just look at those two things. So first, how should we not fast? Look again at verse 16. He says, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. They disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Uh, he, He calls these type of people hypocrites. Uh, It's a Greek word, it's like a actor. Basically, so, so think about what an actor is, right? So it's, it's somebody who is one person 
who, especially in this time, they would put on like masks and, and costumes or outfits so that they could portray themselves as a different character for you to see. But you know that's not truly who they are. That's just a mask, and it's, it's something they want you to see for this purpose. And you've probably maybe experienced this a little bit, that distinction. Like, if you have a favorite actor, you, you know, watch somebody in TV shows or movies, and you think, oh, they're so funny, and they seem so nice and great in the show. And then you, like, watch a couple interviews, or you see some videos of them, and it's like, oh, dang, they're like a jerk in real life, you know? But it's like this weird distinction where it's like, oh, I thought I knew them in this show, and you kind of feel like you do. And then in real life, there's somebody different, and that's how acting works, because you are who you are, and in acting, you're portraying something different to people. Jesus says, don't fast like that. Don't fast so that people think you are super disciplined and spiritual. If that's your motive, he says, we don't fast like that in his kingdom. Don't put on the spiritual mask of fasting so that you'll be seen as someone who you truly aren't internally. And I think, I don't know if that's a helpful word for anyone this morning. Oh, how we are tempted to do certain spiritual things, to put on that mask so that people see us in one way when that's not truly who you are inside. Jesus warns strongly again and again, we do not live like this. And he says, he says that these hypocrites, uh, they look gloomy, now, if you've ever tried to fast for the first time before, that's a pretty accurate word, right? Like, it, it kind of feels a little gloomy. I think that's a great word for it. Uh, essentially, what they do is they intentionally try to look like they're having a hard time. Like, they're trying to look tired and hungry, and, you know, they look out of sorts. Because when they do that, people are like, what's going on? Oh, they're fasting. Man, they're really grinding it out for the Lord. You know, they're suffering, right? It's like you're portraying something so that people will actually see you in a certain way. Jesus says, look, don't try to fast. It would be like, um, you know, if you were fasting, you know, this Thursday, and you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set up, like, lunch with five of my coworkers, and we get to the restaurant, and you look, and it's like, oh, this all looks so good. I guess I won't eat, you know. It's like, well, why aren't you eating? Well, I'm, I'm fasting, you know. And it's like you're intentionally doing something to try to get people to see you as someone who is disciplined and someone who fasts. He says, don't do it just so other people see you. Now, quickly, I do think this maybe is a question you're asking. It's one thing I thought this week. I was looking at it, and I was like, okay, so does this then mean that you should never allow anyone else to see you fast, or if they do, does that ruin the whole thing? Or, you know, should we never fast publicly or corporately with a group of people? I mean, doesn't it kind of seem like that in the text? You just read verse 16, it feels like, okay, don't do that, do it in secret. Well, here's my short answer to that question. Uh, no, I don't think it means that. And I would like to move on, except that that seems like it puts me at direct contradiction with Jesus, which I never want to do. So, let me explain why I think that that's not exactly what Jesus is saying. Um, again, if you just look at the scriptures, you look throughout the Old Testament, and there was a number of times and examples while the people of God fasted together. Okay, so they actually were in public fasting. In Nehemiah 9, the people of God are confessing their sins and they fasted together. In Joel 2, we saw it earlier, he calls people out of their rebellion and to fast. 1 Samuel 31, the people are grieving the loss of their king, and so they come together and they fast. There's all these different examples. Even in Matthew 6, uh, he talks about giving, and he says, don't let anyone see you give. He talks about praying, don't let anyone see you pray, don't let anyone see you fast. And then you read the rest of the Gospels, and you read the early church, and you see actually Paul called the church to come together and throw their finances in so that they can support the work of missions. And you see multiple times where Jesus brings people to pray or where the New Testament church was praying and they were fasting together. So you have all these examples that never get rebuked. It's really shown as a positive example of people coming together. So why does Jesus, or what does Jesus mean here then? I think what he's saying is that the problem isn't that someone sees you fast, the problem is you doing it so that someone sees you fast. All right, does that make sense? Are you tracking with that? It, it's not just that I'm fasting and somehow somebody saw me and it's like, man, you're a hypocrite, right? It's not, it, we don't need to get concerned like that. He's saying 
don't fast for the reason, the purpose of, so that you get approval or something from people. Uh, Again, this seems to be God's rebuke of his people in the Old Testament. In Zechariah 7, the people are fasting together, and God doesn't come and say, what are you guys doing? Like, everyone's noticing you fasting. Why are you doing this? That's not what he says. He comes and he asks them the question, but was it for me that you fasted? That was the rebuke. He said, you're fasting wrongly because you're not fasting for me, and I think that's what Jesus is trying to communicate. He's saying it's not just about if someone sees you or not. He's saying it's about the heart. Are you fasting for others, or are you fasting for the Lord? So just, just by pastoral word for us, I, I don't think we should get hung up and anxious on you know, if someone's seeing me fast, or if my city group can fast together or not. I don't think it's that. I think we need to consider, are we fasting because we desire others, or are we fasting because we desire God, because we want God. Wrong fasting is about desiring others. Healthy fasting is about desiring God. Or John Stott says it this way. He said, fasting isn't about advertising. It's about disciplining. Okay? Think about that. He says, it's, it's not about advertising that you're fasting. It's about disciplining your own self. Uh, and I love that because I think at the core, isn't that what fasting is? You know, like there's some spiritual disciplines that are kind of like enjoyable and it's great and you like it. And then there's fasting. And fasting honestly is a discipline. Like it is work to do it. Because think, what you're doing in fasting is you are acknowledging, I have a need, I have a craving. Like my body actually has a need and craving right now. And I am going to withhold the substance that will meet that need in order that I might discipline my soul. That's what we're doing in fasting. We're saying, I need food and I'm going to not partake in it so that my soul can recognize and be disciplined to desire God more than food. Um, you know, I think we've, we can at times have dulled our spiritual senses so much that we don't even recognize how deeply our soul desires and needs God. Your stomach, you recognize like that, right? You, get, you miss like... 30 minutes of a meal, and it's like you're stuck, you get hangry, you get upset, you know your body needs it. Yet for some reason, our spiritual senses are so dulled that we think we can go day after day without delighting in and enjoying God while our soul is shriveling up. How we need fasting in our day. We need this disciplining work. So if that's how we shouldn't do it, just for others, how should we fast? Um, before I get into this, let me just reiterate one more time. I do recognize and want to say that for some, because of health reasons, fasting from food may not be wise or even possible. Um, my wife right now is pregnant and has diabetes, so she ain't doing a 24 to 48 hour fast. Like, that's not in the cards, all right? Um, but, anyway, but um, there are other ways to fast, but here's the thing I want to encourage. For some of you, that might be the case. You you really can't fast from food, and that's okay. There's grace for that. We can fast in other ways. For most of you, you saying that I get a headache and I get tired and a little cranky, like, yeah, so does everyone. All right, that doesn't mean you can't fast from food. That probably means you actually need the disciplining work of fasting in your life. So I'm speaking to most of you. I'm going to hone in on food. But again, if you can't do that, I would love to help you think through what does other types of fasting look like. So we can totally do that in seasons or for certain people. But when we consider fasting primarily in food, I want you to consider it in two ways. I want you to think about fasting routinely and reactively. Okay, routinely and reactively. Uh, So first, and this is the way I think we normally think about it, I think we could have a practice of routine fasting in our life with God. Um, I do think, this isn't biblical law, but I do think that one of the healthiest practices is a 24-hour period once a week. Um, I think that's a great way. It's almost like a, you know, we Sabbath with the Lord once a week, and we sat and we find rest and delight in Him. A fast once a week is like Sabbathing from food to find your cravings and desires for God and to help reorient them. Um, And so I think that's a great practice. Now, if you've never fasted before, don't try to start there, okay? So I would say that's the goal, but again, let's just take baby steps up to it. So here's, over the last couple of years, I've been growing in my practice of fasting, so here's just kind of what I did. 
All right? I started by simply delaying a meal for just a couple minutes. Okay, so I didn't start by just, I'm gonna go 12 hours or 24 hours. Uh, I started by just, okay, let's just delay food. So here's what that would look like for you if you try it. I think it's a great place to start. Let's say you get your lunch break at noon, you get there, you're about to grab your food, you're feeling hungry. Instead of just going and, and grabbing whatever that is, you stop for a second. You become aware of my stomach, like I'm legitimately hungry right now. My belly needs that burger, okay? Like I, I need that in this moment. If that is true, how much more does my soul need communion with my maker? Like how much more does my soul need the life-giving presence of God? And if you don't really feel it, what I would say is I would just pray, God, would you help me recognize that need? And then go eat, right? That can be two minutes. Like it's not a ton, but what you're doing is you're setting up the practice of I know that I have a physical need. I'm going to delay that for a couple minutes to recognize my spiritual need with the Lord. I'm going to pray that he would help me in that, and then I'm going to go eat, all right? And just start there. And from there, you can slowly build. Like after a while of doing that, then maybe you actually skip lunch, and you eat breakfast, and you eat dinner, but you take that time, the 30 minutes or whatever, and you read, and you pray, and you sit in silence, you just ask the Lord, help me to recognize my need for you. And you keep just expanding it out slowly, hours by hours, until you get to a practice of 24-hour fasting. So if you haven't ever fasted before, I think we work toward the routine of fasting in our life to where we get to the place where once a week we are spending 24 hours. I do it like dinner to dinner, okay? So I eat dinner one night and I'll eat dinner the next night and the 24 hours in between, uh, I just fast. And I pray more and I ask the Lord to meet me, to, if he has anything to say to me, if there's anything that I need from him or I just enjoy him in a unique way. And I feel that need for him. Uh, but we, to do this, we've got to move slow and move intentionally. All right? So that's the routine that we would grow in that. I also want us to think about fasting reactively. Okay? And this is the one I think probably most of us haven't heard taught on or experienced much. Um, but again, throughout the Old Testament, this is actually the predominant one that we get in stories, is that something's happening in someone's life, and so the people of God or an individual fast over it. So let me just give you three big categories, and I would just ask you, just consider if, fast, if the Lord might prompt you to fast in any of these cases. The first one that we see in the Old Testament is fasting in repentance. Fasting in repentance. Uh, again, this was Joel 2, this is Nehemiah, this is all over the scriptures where you would see people have a like kind of a recognition of their sin, and part of their repentance is spending a season in fasting. Again, maybe a day, maybe a few days, or a week, or whatever, but they take some time to fast. Now, let me be clear. Is there extra forgiveness for you when you fast? No. Okay? D d is there like an added element of earning God's grace for you if you fast? No. Is there like a special layer of the blood of Jesus that you get to if you fast? No. Fasting in conjunction with repentance isn't for God, it's for you. Okay? Because what happens is when you recognize your sin and you realize the destruction that that brings, the emptiness that that brings, you fast to get your body in a state of saying, this is what my living in my sin feels like and looks like, and God is so much more satisfying than that sin. It's helping you preach the gospel to yourself by physically going under something like fasting to help your soul get there. Um, maybe consider one of the reasons why you struggle to desire God is because you have not taken the sin you're living in very seriously. And fasting along with confession and repentance might be a really healthy process for you. A uh, second, in the Old Testament, we see fasting in grief. Fasting in grief. I mentioned the example in 1 Samuel 31. The people of God, they're grieving over their king who has died, and it says they come together in grief and they fast. Uh, now notice, when you're doing that, what can often be the mindset is, you know, you're feeling grief and we don't really like to have the feelings of grief, right? Fasting in the midst of that is not like a, a, a you know, quick trip out of grief. The unfortunate thing for where we have to get our minds to is that it's not quickly erasing that grief or getting us through it. It's actually letting us feel it in greater ways. And we don't tend to want to do that, 
But I'm telling you, if you fast in the midst of grief and you let those feelings be there and you become aware of them, God does a unique work in meeting you in the grief than if you just kind of skip over it or cover it up. Um, I've experienced this, I know many of you, in the midst of grief, if you actually allow that to come over you and to feel it, God is, the, experiencing God as a comforter is so much more real and near. Experiencing him as if, you know, my soul feels like my stomach does in this morning, just turning, upset, empty at the bottom. And fasting preaches to your soul that God is near in those moments. And again, I wonder for some of you, If there's been a hardship in your life and you've been trying to just gloss over it, maybe you've been running from God in that, I would encourage you to consider fasting in the midst of it. You will then feel it more, but I think God can meet you there and comfort you and heal you in a far more real way than just skimming past the grief. Uh, Lastly, consider fasting in pursuit, okay? In repentance, grief, and pursuit. Uh, David's an example for us in this. If you remember the story where he has the affair with Bathsheba, she has a son, and the son gets sick. And David immediately turns, asking the Lord to help, and he fasts in the midst of that. He's seeking the Lord as his helper. He's asking the Lord to work in a real way, and he fasts in order to get himself in the place of realizing that it is, in fact, the Lord who can help. Now again, This is not twisting the arm of God to get him to do what you want. What fasting does is when you need an answer from God, you need help from God, or you're just simply trying to pursue and seek out the presence of God, fasting in those moments can preach to our heart that it is truly God who helps us, that it is truly God who is our refuge, that whether or not we get the thing that we are fasting for, it preaches that he is more satisfying than anything else. Fasting as we seek God uh, helps preach these truths into the depths of our heart. So uh, maybe that's it for you. You've been trying to desire God. You've been asking God for something. Um, Just consider having fasting be a part of that process as you try to seek God. So routinely and reactively, I think God invites us into the habit of fasting. Uh, But let me drive last thing home here. Because Jesus in this passage, I don't know if you noticed it when we read it, he does give us the the why. Why do we fast? Did you notice that when he talks in 16 about what the hypocrites do, they want people's approval and affirmation, and he says they received that reward. They got it. People think they're great. Cool. You know, like they got it. But then he says if you seek God in fasting, then the Father will give you a reward. I think what Jesus is saying here is simply, Christians, choose the better reward. <laughs> right? We don't want to think like that oftentimes, but he, Jesus is literally saying, hey, you got two options here. One is fleeting and not very like sure or life-giving. One is firm and certain and validating. Just pick the better one. That's what Jesus is saying. If I can boil it down, that's what he's trying to say. He's saying, look, if you, if you are trying to fast or show that you're disciplined and spiritual, for other people to think of that, great, they will do that, and you know how fleeting and unsatisfying that is when you're just basing your life off someone's approval. But on the flip side, he says, if you do it for God, if you try to desire God, if you try to live with God and you fast for that purpose, you will get what God promises you will get, which is more of him. Uh, It's like I remember when I was a kid, the first few times, you know, you're growing up and you get like some money for the first time. So you get a dollar for your birthday or $10 or whatever it is. I remember, you know, I'd get, you know, as 10 years old, I'd get $5 or whatever. And immediately, like I would go out and buy like, you know, candy or if I had enough, like a pizza or something. And it was like, I got money in. All right, I'm going to go spend that and get something really quickly. But then what would happen is, you know, I'd get $5 or $10. I'd go buy some candy. The next day I'd want, you know, a video game or something. It costs 40 bucks. So I tell my parents, hey, uh, can I get a video game? They say, well, yeah, go buy it, right? Like you go spend your money and buy it. So then I'm looking, you know, and, and all my money is just in the form of gobstoppers and snicker bars in the kitchen. And I'm like, well, I chose this kind of like fleeting sugar rush over something that actually is more lasting and more enjoyable in the long run. Jesus is saying, look, 
Don't settle for spiritual disciplines, particularly fasting, for the fleeting sugar rush of somebody's approval of you. Settle into fasting so that you can get God, so that you can desire him more, so you can experience him more, so that you have the greater reward. This is Jesus' point. Choose something firm. Because when we fast, we are reminding ourselves of all the things that we did not deserve and that we should not have, but that we have now in Christ. He says, all you once had was emptiness and fleeting things of this world, and now you can be filled with God. Right? Like we, we hear this gospel story, and we think about it, and we fast because by faith we've been given everything in Christ. Think about what he's done for us. He has actually bought with his blood a relationship with God Almighty as our Father. He has united himself to us so that we can actually abide in him and know him and have the the king of the universe, the one who will sit on the throne forever, actually with us, united to him. He sent us the Holy Spirit so that we can commune with him and hear from him and be connected to one another. We have all of that. So here's the reality. When you fast, you have received that by faith, but you experience it through some of these practices. He's saying choose the better reward. We fast because it's greater. It, it, the reality is when you fast, you are never empty, right? Your belly, like you feel empty and fasting says, but I am not actually empty. I am filled in Christ with the presence of God. And so while your body may lack, fasting reminds us we are not empty. We have Christ and we fast and we do these disciplines simply to experience more of him. Let me pray. Father, you're so kind and good uh, to give us practices to know you, to experience you. Um, God, I pray for anyone who, um, maybe particularly right now, I'm just thinking about those three kind of reactive areas, maybe for people who are stuck in sin, for people who are kind of in the the depths or the pit of grief, for those who are simply here because they just need an encounter with you. They need to desire you and to want you more than the things of this world. For anybody in those places, I pray that you would prompt them and give them the courage and the ability to begin the practice of fasting. May we do this not as a, a... just religious ritual activity. May we not do it so that we can show off to other people. Oh, how fleeting and worthless people's approval truly is. It's just, it's nothing compared to knowing we have the validation and approval of the Father, that we get to experience you, the power of the Almighty Spirit of God inside of us, that we can abide in Jesus. Would you help us be compelled by that? God, do this in us as a church. May we desire you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise